Um, so welcome to this third session of the GLO eHero special sessions. We have three presenters in this session. We have Kelsey O'Connor, we have Alberto Prati, and we have Robin Kornietzny. Um, and in these special sessions, each presenter um, has a discussant who has already read their paper and has five minutes to provide uh, some comments on the paper. And then if there's time, we open the floor for a general discussion. Um, so now the first presentation is by Kelsey O'Connor and the discussants later on will be Robin Konietzny. So uh, the floor is yours, Kelsey. Yeah, and, and again, uh, please let me know if I'm, you know, hitting 15 minutes or, or whichever time you'd like. Yeah, to I'll tell you two minutes before. Yeah, two minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think uh, you're all familiar with Eastland Paradox. I know some of you have contributed to uh, work on it before. Um, so what we're trying to do today is just add some further clarification and some new evidence. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a former student of Richard Eastland, uh, and I was really honored to participate in uh, you know this new handbook chapter, and then he asked me to, to give the presentation. Uh, so I was happy about that. Um, all right, let's get started uh, with an example. Oh, I need to click here. There we go. Uh, we need further clarification and evidence. And here uh, we can look at the views of Robert Barrow, Nobel laureate, um, in the, the well-known paper by Stevenson and Wolfers, Economic Growth and Spiritual Well-Being, Reassessing the Eastland Paradox. So he says here that happiness and income levels are correlated, makes sense. This is in reference to the Stevenson and Wolfer's findings. However, if the results indicated otherwise, he would conclude that either the data or the methods were flawed in some way. Not that there's no relationship between happiness and income. So here's a, you know, a Nobel laureate who's an empirical economist saying that he would ignore the evidence if uh, it didn't confirm his previously held beliefs. Uh, so you know, this is one of the reasons why we need some further clarification and evidence uh, you know, related to the paradox. But to be precise, let's, let's define the paradox. Uh, so here, uh, this is a recent definition uh, that will come out in the new dictionary. Uh, the Eastland paradox is the contradiction between two empirical income happiness relationships. So countries that have higher GDP per capita are on average happier, but over time, countries with greater GDP per capita growth do not experience greater increases in happiness. Right, so the, it's the contradiction between these two relationships. So a lot of people refer to the paradox as they imprecisely thinking about just this GDP per capita growth um, or the time series uh, aspect of the paradox. But in fact, it's uh, the contradiction between the two sets of findings. Uh, so I, I see there's somebody in the chat now. Uh, so what I'll do is I will uh, come to questions at the end. However, if somebody has a you know, burning, clarifying question, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Just uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, stop me. Uh, we'll look at uh, some examples to, to illustrate this. So here's the, the classic cross-sectional relationship. On the left, you have mean life satisfaction. Across the bottom, you have per capita GDP on a logarithmic scale. You see this positive linear slope here. And notice the title says that each doubling of GDP is associated with a constant increase in life satisfaction. So uh, here's another Nobel laureate, in this case, Angus Deaton, uh, inferring from cross-sectional uh, cross data a uh, time series relationship. You know, another reason why we need to uh, further illustrate, uh, you know, provide evidence for the Eastland paradox. Um, so here's the time series relationship, uh, United States, uh, 1970s to 2010s, uh, 2015. And, you know, GDP per capita, you know, adjusted for inflation uh, nearly doubles. Yet happiness is uh, fairly flat. So this is something that I, I think you're all familiar with, uh, but just helpful to illustrate the, the difference between, you know, the cross-section time series. And this uh, harks back to Eastland's original findings, which related to the United States. All right, so continuing on with the definition, so uh, as you know, Eastlin uh, first documented this in 1974, uh, but since he's added to the definition, so he and colleagues clarified that it's the trends of GDP per capita and happiness that are unrelated. Well, short run fluctuations are positively related, for example, during recessions. 
you know, we know during the, the Great Recession uh, or, you know, the financial crisis, and, you know, also uh, to some extent during COVID-19, that the declines in GDP are associated with declines in happiness. Uh, so we'd call these the short run fluctuations, not the trends. Uh, to further illustrate this and to you know, uh, kind of set up our overall conceptual background, what we're thinking about, uh, this figure is quite helpful. So note here on the left, you have both income and happiness. Across the bottom, you have time now. And you have two trends. So you have income and happiness here. Uh, and you can see when you move from peak to trough, peak to trough, uh, there is a corresponding movement between the two uh, you know, uh, series. However, when recovering from the trough in income, you have a larger increase in, uh, sorry, it, when income recovers from the trough, you have a larger increase uh, and happiness maintains, uh, it goes back just to where it was before, maintaining a similar level. So you see that the trends over time are distinct, but the short run fluctuations are, uh, are similar. So it's, you know, but it's important to distinguish here, right? So if we believe that, you know, income is going to lead to better lives, uh, better, let's say in subjective terms, then income should have a lasting impact on happiness or GDP should have a lasting impact on happiness, uh, not just one of short run fluctuations. So uh, it's you know conceptually important to uh, you know look at these trends, not just the short run fluctuations. So yes, it makes sense to avoid the impact of recessions, but over the long run, we need to look at the trends of these two. Okay, that brings us to the new evidence. Um, so what does it look like? So here we go back to the European Values Study and World Values Survey uh, kind of body of data. Uh, it gives us the largest cross-section of countries with a long time series. And note here that the country groups have been broken out into four. So we have the transition countries from, uh, you know, the former communist countries, and then they've broken into two groups. So expansion only countries are countries in which we first observe life satisfaction after the fall of communism and the full cycle countries uh, Hungary is a, a good example where we have data actually going back into the 1980s. And so we can see both the, the collapse and the recovery. Okay, less developed, developed countries are fairly straightforward. And then, you know, going back to the transition countries, you see here that GDP per capita and life satisfaction both grew at much greater rates than any of the other countries. Less developed are still fairly fast in, in growth, uh, GDP growth. Uh, but much more than, you know, the full cycle and life satisfaction. Uh, so, you know, they're really distinct uh, countries. And this is because they are, uh, you know, only the, the series is only covering the expansion after the fall of communism. Uh, note that, you know, the, the long time series. Also, I like to point out that in each country group, life satisfaction is actually increasing. So it's not that life satisfaction is flat as uh, some authors uh, pointed out, or like the United States example earlier. So what does the relationship look like? So here we are looking at the, along the left, the annual change in life satisfaction. And then across the bottom, the GDP growth rate again in annual terms. So you have changes and changes, uh, long run uh, changes. And the solid line is the relationship in all of the countries, excluding these expansion only transition countries. Uh, and you see that it is fairly flat. Uh, and the statistical significance is uh, presented in the paper. It's, it's insignificant statistically. However, when you add in the expansion only transition countries, you can see that you know, a bulk of them are above the line and it's going to shift up the, the curve here. So we have uh, now a statistically significant relationship, but it's due to these countries, which have faster growth rates in both GDP and life satisfaction. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you look at the relationship in the, let's say the, the long run relationship in the set of countries really reflects that you see an in, uh, insignificant relationship. It's only when you add these others that you see it's something significant. Uh, which is part of the reason why you might see differences in some uh, critiques of the, uh, of the paradox of the long run uh, time series part 
Uh, and you know what's interesting here is it's not that these countries actually have a positive relationship themselves. So here we look at uh, each country group uh, independently, and you see, in fact, these expansion-only countries actually have a negative relationship between GDP growth and life satisfaction growth. And each country group here has a negative relationship, uh, except the developed countries, uh, somewhat surprisingly. Uh, however, it's quite small, as you can see. So uh, in the World Value Survey, European Value Study, uh, and so it's our, our largest set of countries with a long time series. Uh, there's no statistically significant relationship between growth and life satisfaction in the long run. Part of what we did though, uh, for this new handbook chapter is we added in the Gallup World Poll. So here you can now see that we have uh, quite a bit more countries especially in the less developed group. Uh, you can see the growth rates again. So actually the growth rates are a bit higher. Note that the, the Gallup World Poll data, right, they start in 2005. So we have a shorter time period, uh, but this is still uh, a, a bit <clears throat> longer than one business cycle typically. The expansion only countries uh, are transition countries. They're all measured post-communism. So they're still a bit recovering and uh, you can see the faster growth rates uh, evident there as well. So we'll also distinguish uh, them in the analysis. So here's a figure displaying that. You see that uh, when looking at just the developed countries and the less developed countries, again, it is a uh, you know, somewhat flat. Uh, now it's a little bit positive uh, relationship. And then adding in these uh, transition countries, the relationship tilts up a bit. And you can see again, part of it is because they have this uh, you know, both faster growth of life satisfaction, or in this case, it's the cultural ladder, best possible life and GDP. Uh, breaking it out into the individual countries, we see, um, you know, actually what I think is most startling is the line in the less developed countries is nearly flat. So a lot of people still think that, you know, growth has a positive impact in the, uh, on life satisfaction in the less developed countries. But this results uh, suggest otherwise. And there are 75 countries in here. So I admit that if you were to look at, you know, say the, the, the least of the less developed countries, the results may be different. Uh, but given our, you know, a fairly standard definition, uh, you know, using the definitions we've been using, there's no relationship here. Uh, and in fact, the, the relationship is, is steeper in the developed countries and, for, and even more in the transition countries, uh, contrary to what we saw in the previous uh, World Value Survey uh, data. Uh, however, this relationship is still not very economically meaningful. So if we look at the, uh, the coefficients, which is uh, in the, it's gonna be in the handbook chapter in the table notes, uh, which by the way, isn't yet available, but there are uh, working paper versions. Uh, so, the coefficient here is actually still just a 0 0.01, which doesn't mean much yet. Uh, but to interpret that, it would take it would still take a hundred years for a one percentage point increase in the growth rate to raise happiness by one point. And you know, a hundred. So I, I think this is uh, fairly, you know, it's not very meaningful. Uh, so and that's the steepest curve that we've got among all of the relationships that we found. So statistically significant or not. Uh, you know, there's no meaningful relationship here. Uh, and that's one of the new def new ways of thinking about this. So there's uh, Edsel Beha points this out quite clearly in a previous paper that, and, you know, and there's also, uh, I just forgot the name of uh, uh, this, uh, I forgot the name of this other author who helps us to, to think about the, the difference between economic meaningfulness and statistical meaningfulness. So, uh, Betzel, uh, Beha, excuse me, is quick to point out though, even if you find a statistically significant relationship, that doesn't mean that, you know, the, it doesn't, it's not strong evidence to reject the, the paradox. Okay, so discussion. So rate of GDP per capita growth rates are not meaningfully associated with greater changes in happiness in the long run. And this is within any of the country groups, including the less developed countries. And even the long, largest magnitude, it would still take 100 years for a one percentage point increase in GDP per capita growth to raise happiness by one point. 
Um, so what's the explanation? And uh, you know, so many of you are quite familiar with, let's say, adaptation, uh, among other aspects. But what we're looking for is an explanation of both the cross-section and the time series finding. So, and the best one seems to be social comparison, which is nicely illustrated here. So you see this young boy uh, who, although has a dessert, uh, the dessert is just incomparable to his friend's uh, large ice cream cone. So this illustrates, at least in some cases, it's not the absolute amount that matters, I think in a, an ice cream or a popsicle or not, but the relative uh, you know, impact that matters. So if you look at this, uh, you know, in a fairly basic mathematical framework, uh, here imagine that you have happiness depending upon the log of income, uh, of your own income, happiness also depending on the log of reference income. So reference being, you know, a, a peer group or possibly uh, your own past levels of income. Uh, but we'll just take it as the peer group in this case, reflecting social comparison. So in the cross section, you know, we have a, a positive coefficient on beta. Uh, so those who earn more are indeed happier. Uh, however, when we look at this over time, you know, let's say economic growth that's equally distributed is going to cause income and reference income to increase at the same rate. Uh, and then we have beta two. So this is reflecting that, you know, image before that, you know, what others have is uh, undercutting our own uh, experience. Uh, it's so that, uh, and, and in this case, undercutting the benefits of economic growth. So if they are relatively equal uh, in magnitude, uh, just opposite signs, then income growth is going to have no meaningful impact on happiness. And uh, there are seminal contributions both by Easterlin, but also Clark uh, and his co-authors. So in that case, he's actually, and, and there are others who are looking at the micro data, not just looking at the macro data, which I have presented here. So uh, my conclusion, uh, and I have some additional slides spending on time, but uh, just to, to give you the most important aspects, is uh, the evidence when appropriately considering the trends of happiness and GDP has been consistent over the past nearly five decades of research uh, from 1974 on now to 2000. 21. GDP alone does not contribute meaningfully, if at all, to happiness in the long run. Um, this is now based on more than 120 countries. Um, however, it does not mean that happiness is flat, as I pointed out in our data, uh, which, you know, so the original paradox paper was written on the U.S. where happiness was flat. I showed you uh, an image where happiness is flat in the U.S. Uh, but in the other countries, it is, uh, it isn't. So that raises the question, of course, when does and or what causes happiness to increase? So I think this is the more important question than, than about growth. Uh, one contribution here is uh, from my colleague, Francesco Serracino, and he finds that economic growth does relate to, to greater happiness when social capital income and quality are stable or improving. So he's uh, looking at essentially you know, interaction terms here or conditions in which growth is positive. Um, Eastland doesn't talk about growth in another paper at all. He just focuses on other determinants, finding that full employment and safety net policies do increase happiness. And this is part of my additional slides if we want to discuss these uh, the evidence here. And my final conclusion would be for the moment, as somebody who's still uh, getting my legs underneath me in the research field, I think we can easily say we need to just better metrics of, of well being than GDP. So that would, that's that. I don't know how much thank time you. I have. Our time. Yeah, thank you, Kelsey. Um, exactly in time. Um, so then we move over to the discussant. Okay. So then you can stop sharing in. Yeah. And then yeah, so uh, Dana will actually be your uh, discussant. Yeah, I will be the discussant based on. Uh, so this is a joint uh, presentation, let's say, with me and uh, Robin. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, how much time do I have my time? Five minutes. 
Five. Okay. Yeah. So then, um, yeah, this is a, a really, really uh, great chapter. And um, I actually want to start with, uh, to me, the biggest paradox is how many people actually get the Easterlin paradox incorrectly. I see this on average <laughs> once a day. And that's not just students, that's also uh, academic. So um, I'm really, really happy about this chapter. And uh, I, I really thank uh, Dick and Kelsey for for, um, for, for writing this chapter and for clearing the confusion. So there have been a couple of other papers by, by Dick that al also do the same thing, but I think that this chapter really, really does, um, does a great job in, in providing also the latest evidence um, uh, on the topic. Um, I consider the chapter a must read for uh, all of us. And uh, if you're considering teaching, um, please, um, yeah, please consider in including this chapter in, in your reading list. It's, it's really well suited for that purpose and actually had some master students read it and it, it helped a lot. It's very well written and accessible and uh, Kelsey presented this main conclusion already, but, but I think this is the clearest uh, um, way in which I have seen the, the results of the Easterlin paradox being put in a perspective. So the so if, if you increase the GDP of a country um, by one percentage points, it would take 8,000 years to raise uh, happiness by one point. So I, I think that that's the, the, the to, at least to me, this is the, the, the the, um, the best way to, 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 to put the results of the Easterlin paradox in, in perspective. So I haven't seen this done elsewhere. So the chapter um, does a good job in explaining that. Um, the, I want to highlight, so Kelsey talked about that, but I want to highlight that one, um, one uh, great aspect of the chapter is that it provides evidence on Eastern Europe. Usually these, uh, Transition economies are, um, in, in analysis, they're swept under the rug um, or, uh, so they are often either excluded from analysis of the Easterlin paradox or used um, as some sort of proof against the paradox. So I really appreciate the careful analysis in the, in, in the chapter that um, actually um, helps us realize what is going on there uh, by providing analysis for expansion only and um, and uh, uh, full cycle countries. So if you're wondering what happened um, in Eastern Europe after communism fell uh, until the mid 1990s, essentially uh, life satisfaction and income fell both dramatically. And then after the mid 1990s, income started to improve, but life satisfaction um, also improved, but at a slower pace compared to income. Um, like I said, um, the, the chapter does a very careful um, uh, job in separating the uh, expansion only countries. So countries here that you have evidence from, uh, let's say the mid 1990s onwards from uh, those uh, that are so-called full cycle countries. So you have data before their economic collapse and uh, actually to test the paradox, you need the full cycle countries in addition. So Kaspar Kaiser was also asking about that. And um, uh, I, I thank uh, Kelsey and Dick for providing this evidence in, in, in the chapter. So you saw this uh, here, but so whether or not you include these countries matters and the conclusions that you draw also um, differ whether you include them or not. And as Kelsey showed, actually, if you only do the full cycle countries, um, the relationship could even be uh, negative. So um, all of these things went really great. Uh, since this is already a chapter that has been accepted and I was the uh, section editor, I just want to provide some general remarks about the Easterlin paradox. I think that uh, we need a little bit more precision in general. This is not specific to the to the chapter, but I think as a happiness economist, we need to be more careful when we talk about the paradox. Yeah, so um, one thing that we should do a better job of is to provide clear definitions of the short, medium, and long runs. Yeah, what is that in terms of years? So the chapter in uh, of Kelsey and Dick does a good job in doing that, but in general, we're quite sloppy. And part of it is because of data limitations, but we need to be clear of, of what these things mean. We also need precise definitions of happiness and income. So for example, in the medium and long run, 
uh, what do we mean? How do we measure um, the average annual change exactly? So are we measuring that based on the beginning and end period values uh, and averaging that? Or are we averaging based on each observation um, that we have uh, and not just the beginning and uh, end periods? Are we using uh, differences in logs, for example, when it comes to, to income? Um, are we talking about uh, hedonic happiness or so affect, or are we talking about life satisfaction? So, so more pre precision on that. And um, a lot of the uh, a lot of people are actually not aware, but the Easterlin paradox is about the unconditional relationship between happiness and income. And many papers uh, throwing control variables or country fixed effects, uh, region fixed effects, etc. Um, time fixed effects um, and uh, uh, um, and uh, try to provide evidence about the Easterlin paradox. So, but but we need to be more precise whether we're talking about the conditional or unconditional relationship and whether we include um, country dummies or region dummies, time dummies, etc. So I think that uh, so one uh, paper that I recently saw is that which was uh, this might seem a bit uh, silly, but one paper that I recently saw was using perceived income and um, and studying the relationship between perceived income and happiness and claiming that our paper was uh, about the Easterlin paradox. So we need to be more. Um, we need to be more precise in saying that it's about actual dollar or euro amount or whatever and not perceived uh, income. And then when it comes to the explanations of the paradox, uh, these are typically done using individual level data from high income countries. This is something that Kelsey and Dick talk about in the, um, in the chapter. But so um, what about the more macro level explanations and what about using data from, uh, from other countries? So with the Gallup Road poll, that would be, would be possible. Um, then um, uh, I, my slides here are somehow uh, not uh, in the order in which I want them to be, but I think we also need to show more systematic uh, evidence about the within country evidence about the paradox. A lot of the, the papers are about the cross country, um, but I think we also should do a better job of covering the within country and also with uh, data from, from developing countries as well. And then one point that Kelsey actually touched upon now is we need to pay more attention about parsing out the fluctuations of these uh, movements in happiness or life satisfaction that are just independent uh, from GDP um, and, and uh, um, uh, differentiate between these fluctuations from actual trends. Um, I think uh, that's all I rushed a little bit, but uh, maybe there is uh, time for uh, additional discussion here and uh, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Milena. So we have time for one or two questions. Um, so you can raise your virtual hand if you want to ask a question to Kelsey or perhaps Milena. I see Casper raised his hand. Ah, I see, yeah, I see two hands. Um, let's do these two. So first Casper and then Clement and try to like keep it short, a bit short. Okay, uh, I, I try to be quick. Um, so. The big problem, I think, with the Easterland paradox is that you have this cross-sectional relationship uh, across countries, right? And it seems to me that that, that cross-sectional relationship can't be explained with either uh, sort of short-run effects, sort of fluctuation stuff uh, on the cross-country level, and it can't be explained with micro-level reference effects. Um, so it seems that one thing that could explain the cross-sectional cross-country evidence would be cross-country reference effects. But there's very little evidence of this. And I think we should have more evidence of it. Um, and I'm just wondering, Kelsey, what do you think about it, how, how to explain that part of the paradox and whether there are any other possible explanations about it from that one? Yeah, so uh, I, mean, I agree. You know, so we're looking at a, a change relationship. I mean, we're, we're, we're taking a time. There's, there's quite a few omitted variables, essentially, uh, that could set up the relationship. Uh, and one was, I mentioned in this paper by Francesco, you know, if, for example, there's a, a different level of inequality in a country or a different level of social trust or institutions or as, as an example. So, um, yeah, it's uh, difficult to do that, uh, you know, as, as you know. So 
Um, yeah, I think as pointed out by Milena, you know, and, and some of the, the comments that we've received, you know, much of this is now agreed upon as long as we use precise terms. So there's still a lot that could be done, you know, uh, and say well, why this relationship is different in different countries. Um, and then uh, to answer your question in the chat, uh, you know, I, I think that we showed you that, you know, there are differences across these different groups, right? So the less developed countries in the Gallup data had the, the flattest curve, and the transition countries had a positive curve. And in the World Value Survey, European Value Survey data, study data, uh, is actually uh, negative. So if you do just look at those countries, you, you do see, and so part of, I think your question is, why do we see different relationships in different groups? Uh, and I don't have an answer for that right now, uh, but we could do that again in the, in the future. Yeah, I asked that question and then you immediately answered it in the presentation, so sorry about that. No, no worries, no worries. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Okay, then we move on to Clemens. Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks Kelsey for this really nice presentation. I, I agree with Milena on that. Um, I always find it a bit, um, you know, hard to believe that the that the notion of relative income is, you know, the only reason why we would observe an Eastern paradox. So, in your opinion, what are the most important other explanations um, for the paradox? Yeah. So uh, we, we do discuss this in the, the handbook uh, at much uh, greater length. And Actually, social comparison to relative income is the, the most important thing for explaining both the cross section and the time series. Uh, however, I think the time series is going to be dependent upon a, quite a few additional aspects, including hedonic adaptation, uh, which is something that uh, will come up a little bit in Alberto's uh, presentation, or at least my uh, discussion of it. So I think that that is important because also if you think about how and, and uh, Von Prague's reference to preference shift, right, or how aspirations just change over time. This is something that we know, and I think is a, personally, I think it's a little bit of a limitation of using subjective well-being over such a long period of time. It doesn't mean that objective circumstances weren't improving. So uh, it means that to some degree that we're also changing our preferences over time. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's, yeah. Um, I think there are other factors influencing subjective well-being than income first. And then I also think that there's hedonic adaptation uh, affecting uh, how we perceive income. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Just, and this to be brief, I, I have uh, you know more thoughts, but you know, trying to be quick. Yeah. Great. Okay, then uh, we move on to Alberto. Sure. So you should see my slides. Good. So thank you for uh, joining. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Martin and Ihiro, for organizing this session. Uh, today, I'm presenting a paper, which is a joint work with uh, Claudia Senik, uh, professor at the, the Paris School of Economics. And it's about uh, subjective well-being, in particular about life satisfaction. So. Uh, the, uh, a declarative measure of well-being drawn from uh, surveys where people are asked a question like the one which is displayed on your screen. Overall, how dissatisfied or satisfied are you with your overall life? I assume many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with life satisfaction and probably even tried to answer this kind of question yourself. But you might be less familiar with another simple question, which is, uh, again, an example from the British survey, would you say that you are more, less, or as satisfied with your life as you used to be last year? Now, I invite you to take 10 seconds and try to answer your question for yourself, if you think that you are more, less, or as satisfied as last year. I guess most of you managed to answer, of course, I'm not asking for your answers, but uh, it's already pretty fascinating that most people can answer this question. Uh, the response rate is very high. And the, the reason that it's fascinating is that not only it's cognitively very difficult, 
to think back at that uh, subjective state. But it seems almost impossible, psychologically and philosophically, it's not obvious that we can think back at a subjective experience such as our past life satisfaction. So what we did with Claudia is that we explored uh, this uh, question, uh, try to understand to what extent can people recall their past life satisfaction and uh, what is the structure, if any, in the discrepancy between what is recalled and what is observed, if people tend to be positive or negative in their reconstruction, and uh, what are the differences between happy and unhappy people in uh, reconstructing their past. Uh, just a quick note about the language. Sometimes I will say well-being or happiness. In every instance, I'm uh, referring to life satisfaction. So what did we do? We gathered basically all the interviews that we found asking uh, questions about recalled life satisfaction. And we compared the longitudinal reports of life satisfaction with the reconstruction. So some of these data sets are panel, we can observe every year the life satisfaction reported by the same person, and then we compare it with the uh, recalled level or difference in uh, satisfaction. Uh, we look at uh, different uh, explanations and we rule out uh, methodological uh, um, mechanisms of the life satisfaction scale, and we end up having a behavioral explanation. We develop a model of recalled happiness, which generates testable predictions about how people recall their past happiness. This is uh, an overview of the findings. So we see that most people feel that they're happier than they used to be. This is not new, but it's a positive note that is worth reminding. And we see that people have a coherent but imperfect recall of their past satisfaction. Uh, imperfect because on average, people tend to exaggerate the improvement in their life. But there is a deeper symmetry. Happy people tend to think that they are better than they used to be, while unhappy people tend to overstate the deterioration in their life or understate the improvement in their life. This is an overview of the presentation. There are basically four studies which are based on four different data sets. And we started with the German socioeconomic panel, where people were asked the following question, how satisfied are you with your life on a scale from zero to 10? And in a particular year, in 2016, they were also asked this pretty uh, unique and intriguing question that is to reconstruct the evolution, the pattern of their life over the past 10 years. And the options are the options which are displayed here, uh, so you have these nine possible uh, patterns. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to see is, okay, there are some patterns which are clearly uh, improving, like you can see the two, the three, or the eight, uh, refers to the idea that people are better off than 10 years ago. So just looking at summary statistics, what, do, what did people choose when asked this question, how their life evolved? over the past 10 years. These are the results. So you see that more than half of the sample chooses, describe his or her evolution of life as a positive improvement uh, over, the, over the past 10 years. Uh, but, uh, but then we want to see, okay, this is the, what the answer to this question, but does it actually correspond to what we observe in the data. So SOAP is a panel, so what we did is the following thing. Um, for instance, we, we took for each answer, so let's say answer three, we took all people who reconstructed their uh, life as a positive improvement over the past 10 years, and then we calculated the average life satisfaction of this group over the 10 years to compare if the reconstructed evolution and the observed evolution are actually compatible. So I don't know about Claudia, personally, when uh, I started this exercise, I was very skeptical about finding any correspondence, but it turns out that actually reconstructions are pretty good. So uh, here are two examples, probably the, more paradig the most paradigmatic examples. Uh, 
this is the average evolution of life satisfaction of people who report a positive state evolution over 10 years. And it actually looks as a state evolution over 10 years. And the people who reported reconstruct a negative deterioration actually looks like a negative deterioration. And it's not only the case of these two patterns. If we look at all the patterns, they're actually all pretty good or at least uh, coherent with the subjective reconstruction. And this brings two good news. So the first good news is that it means that we can compare life satisfaction over time in a meaningful way. If there was fully adaptation or full shift of the scale, we would not observe these figures. And the other good news is that memory, the people can to some extent recall their past satisfaction. If the answers were absolutely random, we would not observe this figure either. So in some senses, people can recall their past happiness. Uh, doesn't mean that they are perfect, clearly not. And there is some hint of the differences, I think, in, in, in this exam. So if you look at, the, at these two evolutions, so this is the average evolution life satisfaction of people who replied three and this of people who replied eight. The two patterns are actually very similar. So probably here around the end, uh, there is a more state increase, but I would not be shocked if someone who has this pattern replied eight. So why did people reply three or eight? So there is an important difference in these two graphs. The scale is the same, but the y-axis is not the same. So if you look here, the people who had a state increase and are uh, and are replying with an average life satisfaction of eight tend to remember a positive steady increase while people who are a little bit less satisfied but experienced a similar increase tend to have a less uh, rosy view so not just a steady progression but with uh, some uh, some plateau of course these are very rough data we cannot infer much but it's an element of uh, the uh, farther study that we did, which is to look at differences between happy and unhappy people. And this uh, was based on the data from the British Household Panel Survey, where people were asked the question that you answered, at least mentally at the beginning, which is that you're more or less or unsatisfied with your life as last year. First thing, again, let's see what are the answers of people. And uh, we see that most people don't feel a big difference with respect to the previous years, but more, uh, um, most of the people who feel a difference feel that they are improving over life rather than deteriorating. The, about one fourth of them say that they're more satisfied, which is uh, quite more than the people who think that they are less satisfied in last year. So at this point, what we did is that we looked at the answer to this question about the variation in life satisfaction and we compared with the actual reporting of life satisfaction over time to see uh, to what extent they stick with each other and what are the differences. So this comparison creates four cases, four reporting behaviors. So the first one, we call it right reporter. What does it mean? It means that we observe a correspondence between the observed variation in uh, the reported variation in, uh, in uh, life satisfaction and what we observe in the panel. And there are what we call insensitive reporters. It's about one third of the sample. We can't say much about these people. Are people who uh, say that they are more or less as satisfied as last year, although we actually observe some variations. But the most interesting cases are the two last cases which we denote as over and under reporters. So let me explain them with an example. Let's say that my life satisfaction today is five. Next year is going to be five again. So I will be an over reporter if next year I'm going to say, yeah, my life has improved. And an under reporter if I would say, no, my life, my life has deteriorated. So what is interesting about over and under reporting is that you can see that there are much more people over-reporting, that is to say, reporting a positive change that we don't observe, rather than under-reporting. 
And when, uh, when we try to dig deeper into this asymmetry and try to understand what are the characteristics of over and under reporter, we find the following. So this is a regression analysis to predict the probability to be an over or under reporter, conditional on a bunch of characteristics and on the level of life satisfaction at the moment of reporting. So what does this nice graph mean? It means that, so this gray line tells us that, for instance, if your life satisfaction is six, you have a 0 point, a 20% probability to be an over, to over report your life satisfaction, while you have much lower probability to under report the evolution of your life satisfaction. And as you can see, the two patterns are pretty stable so that the higher you are on the life satisfaction scale, the more likely it is that you're going to say, hey, I'm better off the last year, although we actually don't observe this in the longitudinal reports. Two points are worth mentioning. So the first one is that this is not mechanical. So it's not mechanical in the sense that it's not driven by boundary effects. Otherwise, we would observe something like as a, a flat curve and then a, a spike around, around the end. And it's not uh, mechanical in the sense that even the, if you're higher on the life satisfaction scale, it's more likely that you recently experienced some, uh, some uh, moving up the scale, but this effect actually plays against this. So the features of our measurement instrument, the life satisfaction scale, cannot fully explain this, uh, this uh, graph that we observe. So at this point, so to, so to, to, to sum up, and this is probably the, the, the most striking result, is that happy people tend to overstate the improvement in their life satisfaction, while unhappy people tend to understate the change in life satisfaction. Now, you might tell me, okay, this is interesting, but it's not very surprising, but uh, the, so happy people have a rosy view, uh, what's new about it? And I think what we learn from, uh, from this is what does it mean to have a positive past? And this is not trivial. And it's not the same as when it is applied to expectations. So if you think at uh, expectations, you, happy people tend to have a rosy view of their future. This would mean having, uh, expecting to be happier in the future and to have a progression toward happiness in the future. Fair enough. But when it comes to the past, there is a logical inconsistency between variations and levels. If I, if I think that people are optimistic about their past, they can't think at the same time that they, they were on a progressive slope and that their past was great. One of the two should be excluded, or both might be true, but this means some logical inconsistency. So at this point, what we wanted to see is, okay, people, happy people feel that they are on a progressive slope. Most people feel that they're doing better off than last year. Does it mean that most people think that last year they, are, they were actually worse off, they are underestimating their past level of satisfaction. We couldn't answer this question with this data, so we moved to two other data sets. So the first one is a French data set where people were asked how satisfied you are, uh, they, how satisfied they were the previous year on a scale from zero to 10. And the other one is an American data set, the Gallup Poll Social Series, where people were asked their level of satisfaction five years ago. So unfortunately, these are not panels, so we cannot compare the actual report of every person. But loosely speaking, what we can do is to consider each country as a person and compare the average recalled satisfaction and average declared satisfaction at the same time t. So I'm going to explain it better through the graph. So I'm showing only the graph for the US because they're very similar for the US and for France. This histogram tells us that in 1971, Americans on average reported a, a, a level of life satisfaction of 6.5. Five years later, in 76, when asked, hey, how satisfied were you five years ago? On average, they reported to be 5.7. This is a quite sizable difference. And it's a difference which holds 30 years later and which holds with uh, recent data from France. So on average, 
people tend to underestimate their past happiness, not only to overestimate their improvement. I'm not going to show you the formal model, but I think you got the lines of uh, what the model says. Here I'm just reviewing the findings. So people seem to have a coherent but imperfect memory of past life satisfaction. They're more likely to exaggerate the improvement in their lives, but with a deep asymmetry, happy people think to be better off than before. They overstate this and opposite pattern for unhappy people. There are some next steps, but I'm curious to hear what Kelsey thinks about the next step, in particular about the mechanisms and the implication of uh, this uh, recall mechanism for decisions, since we know that decisions are largely based on the recalled hedonic experience, as well for measurement issues. We don't have much uh, recent data about recalled happiness, but there are some uh, interesting uh, characteristics that uh, make us think that it could be used as a good welfare measure. And at this point, thank you for your attention. If you're curious about the working paper that came out last year. Thank you, Alberto. Really interesting paper. Um, so we will move on to Kelsey for discussant comments. Okay, uh, so I think it's it's very interesting. And um, Alberto, forgive me, I'm going to take a part of the discussion to uh, take us through one of my favorite uh, illustrations, examples from the course uh, that Eastland teaches on happiness, um, which is I think is, is is quite pertinent. And then I do have some additional discussion, which I may end up just having to send you. Uh, I did try to answer your questions, but uh, I don't know if we'll have time for it. So. Um, here is uh, an illustration from one of Easterlin's papers, uh, one of his better cited ones. So on the left, you have subject well being, happiness. Uh, across the bottom, you have income. And then note here, you have different aspiration levels. So that's what could be what's going to be a little bit different here. Um, all right, there's kind of a matrix of uh, you know, outcomes here. What I'll do is uh, take us through a couple. All right, so if we look at changes in time, if income goes up, um, you know, so from, you know, this median level to Y2, uh, then subjectable being also goes up from, let's say, point, point 0.2 here to point 0.3. So we move here. But that's if aspirations are kept constant. Now, if aspirations are reduced, uh, rather, sorry, increased going from A1 to A2, um, say due to hedonic adaptation, preference shift, uh, then we, uh, you know, return back to the original level moving now from 3 to 5. So this is uh, something for explaining change over time, but also works for memory. So individuals remember how their remember their circumstances, but not how their aspirations change. So what they remember is YM, not A1. So they think that they move from four to five. So uh, in which case, when they're looking back, right, they remember their life being worse off. Uh, in general, because they don't remember their, you know, reporting function or aspirations. Uh, and this applies to just the happier people. So this is part of, I, I see as your contribution, uh, you know, in Eastland's earlier work, he was looking at the population as a whole, not the happier versus the less happy people. Um, you know, if we look at the unhappy people to try to explain what it is that you found, so say we have a movement here from Y1 to YM, a movement from this unmarked period to, uh, to four. Uh, but then, you know, people don't remember uh, this improvement in life satisfaction or happiness. And, you know, so they actually, what they remember is a movement from one to four, not from this unmarked period to four. You know, so for this to work uh, in terms of aspirations, this requires remembering an increase in aspirations you know, moving from A1 to A2, when that in fact didn't happen, it actually moved from A2 to A2. You know, and this, to me, doesn't, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, I think. So I, I think that um, aspirations are, you know, a, a change may be a way to explain your results for the happy people, but not a way to explain the results for the unhappy people. 
So uh, here I'm saying this, uh, you know, unremembered or unnoticed changes in aspirations can explain the results for happy, but are not too likely to work for the unhappy. And, and I think this is an important contribution. And, you know, you uh, focus on the current level, but there may be other aspects uh, that could be interesting, you know, to look at. And for me, most of which is going to be personality, which we'll come to now. So, you know, in the abstract, you say happy people will call the evolution of their life to be better. So uh, you just said that it doesn't make sense for this to work for optimism. But for me, it's a report happy now. Um, you look at things positively. And then you, when you're recalling, you know, it's, you may be thinking about the evolution and say that and say you had a rosy or positive evolution over time. You're not thinking about having a low level in the, bat, in the past, that might be a, you know, a pessimistic view, but just having a positive change over time. Things are getting better. That makes sense uh, for an optimist to me. Uh, here's another quote. So people remembered well, people's remembered well-being seems to be influenced by the current level of life satisfaction. So it seems to be, there's nothing wrong with this, but I think it could of course be some third variable such as personality. And indeed, this is not clicking forward. Sorry, here we go. You control for life circumstances in study one and show how residuals behave in the same way as uh, the raw life satisfaction scores. And, uh, you know, it's suggestive that it's actually the residuals, not necessarily life satisfaction itself, which drives the relation. Oh, and I got Talita drawing here, it looks like. Um, <laughs> these residuals have uh, an interpretation, however. So uh, in, I think it's uh, Cummins, 2001, if I remember correctly, it's referred to as positive cognitive bias, which uh, Graham, Carol Graham refers to. Then uh, Groovin, Krauss, and myself all refer back to this. Uh, and I'm actually quite explicit about it in the uh, conceptual framework of my paper. So I think those residuals you know, could be interpreted like optimism, and in which case it's optimism explaining the result, not the current level, uh, the reported level. And, you know, you, you mentioned this in the discussion, you know, how optimist, optimism, openness to new experience, you know, uh, are, you know, could be impacted and how people then make choices uh, or the results have an implication uh, in this regard, how people make choices. But these variables are actually included in the socioeconomic panel. And so you could test this. I think risk preferences to uh, I think Krauss is in the audience. He could, he could clarify or maybe one of you others uh, can do this. So I'd be really curious to test this. Uh, and it, it may be the case that it's a personality trait that's more important than the reported level. Um, I, I think I may be running low on time. I, I do have some more stuff that we can discuss uh, afterwards. Uh, Martine, I leave it to you. Yeah, maybe we can first do a general discussion and if you have time left after the general discussion, you can uh, continue with some more questions, okay. but it depends a bit on how many people want to ask. Some yeah, okay, comments. so I'll stop sharing for a moment. Okay, um, so let's first move to Kasper for a question or comment. Funnily enough, my, my hand was just up uh, because <laughs> I, I had a question from last time, but, but I have a, a, a question nevertheless. Um, and the question is, What do you think ultimately is the thing that matters? Is it is it the memories of, of how stuff changed, or is it is it your current assessment? Uh, and the second question is: Are you are you really sure about the the causal direction? So is it really the case that your current satisfaction level determines your memory, or might it be the other way around that that your memory is determining your current satisfaction level? So. Thank you, Casper, for the discussion. Of course, I didn't have the time to thank you. Thank you, Casper, for, for the questions. I think you know me well enough to know already the answers, which I'm going to give. But just the so for the causal direction, uh, no, we're not sure. This is actually a matter to a large extent, a matter of assumptions. And the uh, we, we don't really have a way to uh, disentangle if there is a functional role, so if actually recalling a better past is beneficial so you feel better, or if since you feel better at the moment of retrieval, when you think back to the past, you're gonna think in a different way. So this is a very important point that we actually want uh, to explore 
uh, farther. Uh, on the question, what does really matter? The memory of the current assessment. So I'm quite a, a big supporter of thinking that the memory are actually very important in a different sense, in the sense that they are complementary, but there is valuable information per se in the perceived change of satisfaction uh, in the sense that on top of saying on an absolute scale how satisfied you are, by saying, I feel better than last year, is it true or not? It doesn't really matter in the sense that it's true according to your subjective experience. And this is enough of uh, an index to tell me that in some meaningful sense, whatever happened during the last year was good to you. And does that answer your questions? Good. I'm not going to ask the question about, oh, didn't the reporting function check? About, about the report. so I, that... I, I would actually, so I was expecting this, <laughs> about the reporting function. So something that I didn't have the time in 15 minutes to say, but it's actually very important is we're assuming through the study that uh, people can meaningfully uh, uh, report their satisfaction on a, uh, on, a, on a scale and that these reports are comparable over time. And when I showed you the graph that uh, shows some correspondence over time, this tells us that the comparison is meaningful. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. It doesn't mean that there is no scale shift. The problem of scale shift is very likely to happen. And the truth is probably in the middle. To some extent, people recall their past in a different way. To some extent, they change their aspiration and their scale, as uh, Kelsey also mentioned. But I'm curious to hear other questions if there are otherwise i'll just take kelsey's point okay thank you um there's also a question uh in the chat um from peter krauser asking which variables do you suggest to capture aspirations but, uh, that may be directed towards me because I, I was. Yeah, that's what uh, I think as well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm not suggesting uh, capturing aspirations. Sorry if I was uh, unclear about that. Uh, I was thinking about the personality traits. So openness to new experience, I know, is measured along with the other big five. Optimism is measured. I think risk preference is. Uh, I don't remember. And these variables, I think, could add dimension to Alberto's paper in the, in the German context. Uh, to help understand, uh, let's say, decision making, which is one of the extensions they're they're thinking about. Uh, you know, if, if uh, people have various different memories, uh, that could influence uh, how they choose to to behave. And I think there's an interacting interaction there with uh, personality. Uh, it would also be interesting to see if you know perhaps uh, memory itself affects personality. Uh, there is change in personality over time. I know a lot of people think of them as traits, uh, but okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm adding a little bit, not just answering to this, answering this question. Uh, to, to get the, the direction of causality there would be quite difficult, but not impossible, I think. So, yeah, okay, that answers the question. Okay, thank you. I don't know, I don't know how we are with the time or time. Uh, yeah, so we have actually two minutes left, um, and there are no more questions. Um, so I, I'm happy to spend one minute just to uh, to reply to to Kelsey. Yeah. So I can't mm -hmm. thank you. And about about the difference in income, I, I, I think you're. I mean, the effect of material uh, or material conditions changing and then changing, basically, where the references and changing the way we reconstruct our past. I think you're referring to a paper by Easterly in, in the, the journal, uh, in the economic journal. So that's why we controlled for income variations in our regressions. So, so that the observed effects, are, we know that they cannot be explained by income variations over time. This is in the British, uh, in the, in the British panel. Uh, as for the residual life satisfaction, uh, I would be curious to talk about it more because it's, uh, I, I never heard about positive cognitive bias as, a, uh, as an interpretation. But I, I can tell you that what I had in mind when uh, um, talking about residual life satisfaction is everything 
which doesn't come from observable factors. So if you ask a person, are you happy with your life? They're going to, and you ask why, probably there is age, health, and uh, uh, income among them, but it, there is also, I just split it with my girlfriend, or I don't know, uh, different things which are going to affect meaningfully your life, but we cannot really observe into the data set. And I'm not sure I would call them bias, although for sure there is a general bias also into this, uh, into this residual part. Uh, I hope what we're picking up is more a uh, substantial effect rather than just a declarative bias. Yeah, so uh, positive cognitive bias, just to clarify, um, it's not actually a bias in the way in which economists use the term bias. It's, let's say, a way of looking at life. Uh, so Carol loosely refers to it as optimism uh, in subsequent uh, descriptions, uh, discussions. Um, and it, it's, I don't mean income aspirations. I mean, aspirations generally just illustrated with income. Uh, so uh, to the extent that you can control for that, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I think we need to move on to the next uh, speaker, and this is Robin Konietzny. Mm -hmm. So you can share your screen. I have to say I, I'm handicapped myself by uh, not being able to, like my, my screen is frozen, but oh. uh, uh, now it starts working again. Okay. Do you see the slide in full yes. screen? Yeah, we can see them. Perfect. Then uh, I will start right away. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for um, yeah your interesting presentations and the life uh, uh, the lively discussions we had thus far, and I'm curious what uh, your take is going to be on um, my paper. Um, the paper I'm going to present today is uh, part of my PhD that I'm writing under the supervision of Milena Nikolova and uh, Bart Lost. And Milena is also uh, with us today. So feel free to put questions into the chat and then um, yeah, either Milena answers uh, shorter questions right away or we can discuss them afterwards. Um, and it's my first project um, in a PhD that focuses on the effects of globalization on uh, workers. Um, both on their more objective and on their subjective well-being. It's titled Trade and Job Insecurity, the two sides of import exposure. And to get you started, um, I would like to confront you with a statement uh, that was stated in a uh, survey of the International uh, Social Survey Program. And it reads as Germany should limit the import of foreign products in order to protect its national economy in uh, three different ways uh, waves um, per participants could answer uh, uh, or could uh, yeah could could react to the statement using five different uh, items they could either agree strongly and then uh, with the different steps in between disagree uh, strongly with the statement and over here i depicted the share of individuals that uh, chose a specific uh, way of reacting to that statement across one digit occupation group. So those are bigger occupational groups, such as managers um, or elementary occupations. And when I looked at the data, um, I had, of course, some, some uh, preconceptions. And uh, I read a couple of papers that looked at what import exposure does to workers and their quite some uh, well-cited studies on the US uh, by um, also Don and Hansen. There are some studies on Germany by Daud Fintas and Südekum, and they mostly look at, okay, what happens to wages if you experience uh, import exposure at the regional or the industry level? And usually you have in manufacturing industries negative effects if uh, those regions um, have a lot of competition from abroad, especially from uh, low wage uh, countries or former low wage countries such as China. So I was wondering, okay, what is uh, the, the um, situation like in Germany for German workers? How do they perceive imports? And over here, what is rather surprising is that the individuals that call for a limitation of imports is rather high, at least with what I expected, because Germany is trading a lot. Usually within Germany, trade is portrayed as something uh, beneficial where industries and individuals benefit from. At the same time, what we can see over here is that there is a difference uh, across occupations. So the managers, they seem to be um, uh, yeah, mostly supportive 
of freer trade, so no limitations. Whereas if you move to the right of the occupation groups, there is more and more support for limitation of imports. And starting from this point, I was wondering, okay, how do uh, occupations and the occupation level import exposure actually relate to the um, well-being of workers in Germany? And in our paper, what we do is we associate import exposure at the occupation level to a non-pecuniary labor market outcome, which is the perceived job security of individuals. Well, importantly, we don't use um, an industry or region level indicator. We will derive an occupation level indicator from an industry uh, trade flow, but we do use an occupation level indicator, which is not that common in the literature yet, but there are more and more studies that use these approaches. And what we then do is that we propose a framework that differentiates between a competition increasing and a productivity enhancing channel of import exposure. Because usually if you have um, import exposure, uh, yeah, the studies focus on import competition. So there's directly a frame that says, okay, imports increase competition and competition might be not that beneficial for domestic workers. That's why um, I was specifically interested in uh, showing like the two sides of the medal of, of import exposure. And accounting for the German trade integration process, I evaluate um, imports from Eastern Europe and China, because especially if I want to relate my studies to the studies for the US, it's important to underline that the German trade integration process was, of course, different because Germany already experienced a um, yeah, kind of trade shock to uh, the opening up or stemming from the opening up of Eastern um, European economies prior to the opening up of uh, China. What do we find? Well, we find that occupation level import exposure does affect job security. So we, uh, we use an instrumental variance approach and show that both Chinese and Eastern European imports generally hold consequences for the perceived job security of German workers. And the imports that we call in competition increasing imports, in fact, um, raise workers' job insecurity because they might potentially substitute for domestic production and thus workers lose their job because um, a foreign worker is now taking over what they did before. Then the exposure to inter-industry intermediate imports, what we call productivity enhancing imports, boost job security because um, companies can use a, a broader variety of intermediate inputs. For example, um, in the car production, you could use cheaper seats um, that you import and thus you can uh, save some costs over there. And this leads uh, then uh, in general by using these uh, intermediate imports from, uh, yeah, from abroad, this leads to cost savings that increases the productivity and thus also has beneficial effects for the individual worker. And then looking uh, at the average um, numbers, so the estimates for the uh, entire sample, we, we can say that productivity enhancing uh, imports or the effect stemming from those more than offset the job security insecurity causing uh, caused by competition increasing imports. Now, how do we arrive at those findings? The data we use is from two uh, main sources. First, we have the individual level data, so the worker level data which we sourced from the German socioeconomic uh, panel, which was already mentioned a couple of times in, uh, before in the presentations, which is a uh, wide ranging annual representative longitudinal study of private <coughs> households. And we are able to match um, this individual level data with the uh, trade data. We take industry level trade data from the world input output database, which was specifically built to assess developments over time. And what makes it interesting, this trade database for us is that we can differentiate between final and intermediate demand purposes. So this would be the, would be the differentiation between a car, a finalized car, or the parts and components that are used in the production of a car. Then we use the 2016 release um, that contains 56 industries over 43 countries. And this uh, data then accounts for 85% of world GDP. So we have a pretty good representation of um, yeah, global trade relations. In addition, there's also a model for the rest of the world. And in our analysis, we also uh, use labor compensation, which we can uh, source from the socioeconomic accounts that can be uh, matched with the World Input Output Database. Then um, to come up with our indicator, we also use employment data from the German Federal Employment Agency to come up with the occupation level exposure. 
cluster data on automation ICT capital um, for uh, control variables. Our empirical strategy is as follows. We have the baseline regression with job security um, on the left-hand side. And that we relate to two main explanatory variables, the change in competition imports at the occupation level and the change of productivity imports at the occupation level. Then we have a battery of individual level controls and uh, we have individual fixed effects and dummies for occupation, region and time. Then um, regarding our dependent variable, it's actually reported on a three point scale. And we both use the original three point scale, but also dichotomize uh, the scale in the two uh, possible ways. And our preferred specification is as follows. We say um, the binary variable takes the value one if job security is three. So individuals are very concerned. And it takes the value zero if job security is uh, <coughs> small or equal than two. So so individuals are not at all concerned or somewhat concerned. Now, how do we capture the exposure? For competition um, imports, we have on the right-hand side over here, we have the proportional increase of imports in the example over here now from China to Germany over two years lagged by one year. And this we said relative to uh, a weighting factor because Imagine over here, this uh, proportional increase is very, very small, right? So it doesn't really matter if it's a really small number of, of goods coming into the German economy. And then there's, say, doubling uh, of this amount of, of imports, but it's still not really important in the, in the bigger picture for the, for the respective industry. So we want to get a sense of how important those trade flows actually are. So we set it relative to the labor compensation that is actually at stake. And uh, with that, I mean, I want to get a sense of what the um, domestic workers might lose in terms of wages if, um, if their work is competed away from abroad. So this is why I introduced the weighting factor over here that includes the labor compensation that the German workers are actually gaining from their production for German consumption. For industry level productivity imports, I have a, a similar approach, but now over here, it's not um, the imports from the same industry. I forgot to mention that before. So over here for the industry level competition imports is only imports from the same type of industry um, that, that uh, produces abroad. So German automotive industry importing from the Chinese automotive industry. Now moving on to the productivity uh, imports, it's about all other industries except the um, automotive industry. So from all Chinese industries that are not the automotive uh, industry in China. So those imports, uh, I sum over here. And again, I want to get a sense of the relative importance in the overall mix of uh, imports. And this time I set it uh, relative to all imports that the German industry uses, intermediate imports that the German industry uses to produce uh, goods to get a sense of the overall importance uh, in, the, in the mix that the industry is using to produce its final output. And then to move from industry to occupation level, I use the following procedure. So on the right hand side, I have the change in industry level exposure. And then I use the data from the German employment agencies. Over here, I have information on uh, how many workers are working in occupation K in industry J. So say this is the number of assemblers in the German automotive industry, divided by all assemblers in Germany, working in Germany. So by using this, I take the import exposure experience by the German automotive industry and basically attribute part of that import exposure to assemblers. And by doing so across all industries, I end up with an occupation level um, exposure measure. Now using the specification and my indicators, I, uh, I would like to show you our baseline uh, regression uh, results, uh, both for an OLS approach and a two uh, stage least squares approach. And over here we can see that, uh, as I mentioned before already, um, competition imports lead to an increase in job insecurity. Um, at the same time, productivity imports lead to a decrease in job insecurity. 
And this holds both for um, exposure to Chinese imports and to Eastern European imports over here. And as we can see, um, in contrast to the findings for the US, exposure to Eastern European imports seems to play a, a more important role uh, for Germany over here because the effect um, is larger compared to the exposure to US imports. And um, there might be some endogeneity, for example. So imagine there's um, a domestic shock in Germany that affects both drop in security and also the amount of imports flowing into the country. To account for that, we um, do not use the um, imports that Germany sources from China, which are, uh, from the Chinese perspective, also the exports of China to Germany, but we use the exports of China to a group of high income countries. So the um, exports of China to this group of high income countries should only be influenced by um, what happens in China. So over there, if you have a productivity shock and China can suddenly offer its uh, products uh, yeah, more cheaply, then this should drive the change in imports um, that the other high income countries uh, source from China. And over here we find uh, that, yeah, our, our results from the, from the baseline OLS regression, they hold and our effects even increase in size. So there seems to be somewhat uh, of a bias in our OLS um, results. And um, looking at the time, I'll also conclude now. Um, we find uh, that import shocks are multifaceted and can both diminish and enhance workers' well-being. So it's important to differentiate between the different effects that imports can have. They're not only competition increasing, but they can certainly also um, improve productivity. Also, um, distinguishing between different trading partners is empirically important and should also be motivated um, by the evolution of, of imports and also, um, yeah, relating to the to the gravity equation in trade also take the geography into account. And it's uh, certainly also true that workers form a perception of trade social and cultural repercussions that goes beyond its material consequences. So over here, we looked at effects that have not materialized in um, wages yet, or in a change of the employment status, but individuals actually uh, perceive or seem to perceive uh, imports, and then come to a conclusion about how that relates to their um, future job security. And for future extensions, um, we have the idea to integrate it in, into a more rigorous trade and task framework. So actually going uh, even lower, um, not looking at a single occupation, but looking at the tasks involved in a specific occupation. And another extension is then that we um, yeah, capture the value added by a business function um, that is embodied in imports that actually uh, a good summary of the second project. So this way we could look at what are um, Chinese R&D activities actually doing and how are they embodied in imports going into Germany. And this we base then on actual income. So we can really say um, this income in uh, say Germany might be uh, under threat by uh, more and more income generated um, by R&D professionals in China. And with this, I would like to uh, end my presentation and I'm looking forward to uh, the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Then I'll first give the floor to uh, Alberto for his discussion comments. Yes, can I? Okay, I'm gonna substitute my slides. Okay, good. So thank you very much, Robin, for the presentation and congratulations for uh, for this study, which is, I mean, I didn't really read the draft, I read a paper. There is so much work already done on the, I mean, that you, that you did with your co-authors and which is very transparent from, from the paper. Uh, you just explained it very clearly. The, the aim of the paper is to estimate the causal impact of import exposure on perceived job security. I really appreciate the fact that uh, you mixed two quite distinct areas of research, international trade and um, um, well-being or uh, perceived, uh, perceived data from, uh, from surveys. And I also really appreciate the fact that you 
put a lot of attention to uh, causal inference. We know that it's very hard uh, in happiness research, but you devote a lot of a lot of effort to this identification. Uh, the question is clearly relevant for policy making, but I would say in general for public debate, there is so much debate right now about globalization and the effects of opening. Uh, in this, this, this kind of topic can change political preferences, they can shift a government, so it's definitely relevant. And you also have an original approach on import exposure for uh, different reasons. Honestly, I'm not really qualified to uh, comment on the international trade part, so on the on the measure you take for uh, productivity enhancing or competition enhancing, but it seems to be very original on on this side. And congratulations for this. Uh, I try to share some comments, which hopefully are uh, uh, helpful inputs uh, for uh, for uh, reviewing this paper. So the. The first one is about the literature on international trade that I honestly, again, don't know very well, but you mentioned that this is basically the only paper apart from another one which focused both on the two sides of, um, uh, of uh, um, import exposure, so the positive and negative side, and I was very surprised by this statement. Uh, I don't have good references in mind, but you might, you might want to either explain a little bit better, like maybe it's a very new concept, or be, um, be, be sure that uh, there is actually nothing there in the international trade looking at asymmetric welfare effects. Because it sounds like a quite classic topic. Um, I need to mention the IV, it's an IV paper, so does the, is the IV convincing? Uh, I think definitely, I mean, for reverse causality is definitely excluded. Uh, you also uh, use an IV which was uh, already uh, used before. Maybe there is some concern about the exclusion restriction. So the idea being that the, uh, there, there might be some third elements affecting both your IV and your uh, perceived satisfaction, uh, sorry, perceived job security, some kind of macro variable which uh, affect uh, uncertainty and then both these variables. I don't have anything specific uh, in mind, but a possible approach would be to check for some placebo variables, something which wouldn't, should not be affected by your IV and that you could find in SOAP and showing that it's actually not affected. Um, an important point, I think it's about the, the choice of removing unemployed individuals from the sample. So I, I perfectly understand why you did it. It makes a lot of sense, but um, I mean, you don't have a perceived job security if you don't have a job. But this creates some structural effects in your sample in the sense that you're basically excluding the people who are at risk of losing job and then actually lose their job. And it might be worth thinking through what this implies for the estimation. Uh, and then just a last point, I, I, I didn't really understand the table about the IV profit estimations because they don't seem to confirm the two SLS in the sense that the, the estimated coefficients are not significant, but maybe I, I misunderstood something there. Um, and then I would say just one, uh, one point uh, so that I can leave the room to the audience about the form. It is a very long thing. It's 50 pages without the appendix. Um, I would suggest, uh, I would join the, so the, the editors of Econometrica recently published uh, a letter asking the authors to shorten the paper to 20 to 30 pages. And I think it makes a lot of sense. It's just easier to circulate your work and the authors are the best people in place to decide what is actually the most important in the main text and what could be moved to, uh, to the appendix. The last, uh, the last, uh, uh, the, the other points uh, I'm gonna send you by by email, or we can discuss in another in another group. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, maybe you want to respond to it, uh, Robin. Yeah, thank you, Alberto, for this very rich feedback. There are many uh, novel points in there actually that I've not heard before. Um, I might just. Um, and so one of your questions regarding the, the novelty of the uh, indicator. 
So um, since many of you might not be that familiar with trade data, um, these input output tables are actually um, great at differentiating between these final consumption goods and intermediate uh, consumption goods. And there's almost no other way um, to differentiate between this competition increasing effect and the productivity enhancing effect other than really looking at, okay, what type of good are you actually importing? And uh, there are some papers coming up now that um, try to incorporate it, but for quite some time, there was simply not the data to make this differentiation. And especially if you look at the import competition literature, they, they're, they're certainly not, not wrong with what they're doing, right? They're just very much focused on the competition increasing aspect and don't really refer to other effects that might be beneficial, right? And there are also other papers that look at the productivity effect, but never really jointly. So there's one um, paper um, in a uh, highly ranked journal that actually looks a little bit at both, but also know what, uh, not based on these input output data that I'm using. So it's, um, it, it's not that I had this brilliant new idea, but it's about the data that I can use and also, um, yeah, also about the expertise, about one of my uh, co-authors, Bart Loss, he's an expert in this. And uh, it, it's just not easy to construct it uh, in a, a robust way. And this is why um, we are claiming that it's one of the first papers to make this, this differentiation in the same study. Uh, thank you. Um... Well, Kasper asks in the chat um, a super boring question, as he says himself, but it's not so boring, actually. So how large are these effects that you show, for example, compared to an additional year of education? Um, I uh, cannot say at the moment what the effect of one additional year of education is. Um, I also have to mention uh, Kaspar Kaiser also helped a little bit with uh, the um, the econometric okay, econometric framework. So I would like to thank you, Kaspar. I think we've not met in person yet, so uh, thank you for that. Um, so this is actually something where I can also use some of your inputs because we we struggle a little bit with um, giving the um, coefficient estimate some some economic meaning, right? So it's certainly not that large, but at the same time we also know that. Uh, yeah, if you take something like, like job security over time, um, I think we have uh, 14 years, then the, uh, and plus you add the um, individual fixed effects, there's not a lot of variation left to be explained, right? So this is why we think that the effect is not too high. And it's, we, we kind of, we are still searching for a way to, to set these effects into perspective. So. What, what we at the moment have, for example, is that the, uh, the largest year effect is yeah, roughly double the size of a, uh, of a one standard deviation increase in import exposure. And that's the largest um, yeah, coefficient that we have in our, in our estimation. If there's time, one follow-up question. Is there a natural scale to the, to the import exposure variable? Sort of, just to understand, sort of, sort of I don't know, is it, is it bounded in some way? Probably, right? So the, it, it's also because we um, take the exposure at the industry level, then uh, attribute it to occupation level, and then also use this weighting factor. It's really hard to directly interpret it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, well, it, it's certainly bounded at, at, at zero. Uh, the lower level is zero. And then the upper bound, um, yeah, I, I don't know it by heart, but it's, it's hard to put a direct meaning to the indicator. So we also have um, some graphs in there where you look at uh, industry level exposure, but it's really hard to, to directly put a name onto the exposure indicator we're using. Yeah, thanks. I, 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 I can totally see how this is a super difficult problem. Yeah, it may, would make it more appealing, certainly. But um, in the end, it's some, some sort of theoretically founded exposure, um, but it, it's hard to put really a name to it. Mm -hmm. um, Kelsey also has a question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Robin. I know we've spoken a little bit about this in the past. Um, what I'm thinking now, 
the way you just described, you know, job security, perceived job security, is it, it doesn't change very much, right? So this this largest impact uh, from a particular year is not a lot of change, or including the fixed effects, it's not a lot of change. So I'm wondering if maybe you can also look at a couple of other outcome variables, uh, wages, uh, employment rates, uh, you know, and there's one that was pointed out in the chat, uh, Milena responded. So, uh, you know, I wonder if there's something else you can, so you, you do show that there is a large impact. That's also a little bit related to Alberto's point about having also a, a placebo. So you show us a couple of other outcomes and maybe that helps convince us uh, that there's something meaningful going on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Kelsey. Um, in the initial version, there was actually job satisfaction included. Um, but then we had a, so using both job satisfaction and um, perceived job security and uh, keeping the same sample made the sample very small. And uh, since we had, uh, since we have this panel data approach, we wanted to have uh, enough observation per kind of occupation uh, year uh, cell. And um, at the same time, also the job satisfaction results didn't really turn out um, significant. And we looked at it, but then at some point decided to only focus on um, the perceived job security um, measure. Also because it, we, we thought it more directly re relates to the, to the effects that might stem from import exposure and job satisfaction uh, than might be a little too broad of an indicator to, to capture the competition increasing and uh, productivity enhancing effects. Um, but if, uh, if, if someone knows more related indicators that we could source from the SOEP, um, we, were, we were very happy um, to, to yeah, test it. Okay, thank you. Um, there are no more questions. So we're at the end of the session. I want to thank all the presenters and um, in 20 minutes, there is a next special session on happiness economics uh, with three great presenters. We have Paul Fenzonville, who is also here now. We have Mariano Rojas and we have Ani Tubaji. So I hope to see you in 20 minutes again. Bye bye. Thanks, Martha. Well, thanks for presenting, uh, Kelsey. Of course, of course. Oh, I see a baby. I see a beautiful baby. Uh, are you on mute, Melina? What? Well, we get to enjoy the view of the baby. Yeah, yeah, you're on, you're on mute, but. She's not behaving, but um, she's uh, crying nonstop today. I don't know why. Um, no. Anyways, thank you for the your you know presentation, especially while you have a, a little one that you have to uh, manage. Oh, it's okay. I hope it made uh, some sort of sense. I asked Robin to take a look, uh, quality control to to take a look whether it makes any sort of sense. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah no, so. it, it, it certainly did, and uh, I, I'm I'm happy. Your little one's happy more than the, I need to discuss it. So <laughs> yeah, her first conference. <laughs> no, it's a great chapter. Yeah, I, I don't know why it's taking so long for it to come out, uh, but uh, now. Yeah. I, I, I can tell you, I, 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 I've had some discussion with the, you know, the person in charge of proofs, but, but, but don't worry. Uh, just... Yeah, mine, ours was the same way. It took four months or something. So I don't know. I, I really don't know. But yeah. but yeah, anyways, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's really great. Yeah. So I've been sharing the Kind of the, the working paper version. Thanks. I, I did change one of the things you asked for uh, was a, a change in reference from the IZA paper to the GLO. And oh, so yeah. I, I did do that. And yeah, if I, if somebody's asking me, I'll share the GLO. So on your, on your behalf. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Then uh, maybe see you in a little bit. I'll see what this one yeah. is doing, yeah. uh, what, what, what she wants to do. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, take care. Yeah. Yep, Take care. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.